And we are live. Good afternoon and welcome to our eighth episode of Moving Forward, Your Leadership Connection during these times. And welcome our special guest, Shelly Archambault, who I will give a proper introduction. Uh, so glad that you all are able to join us today. And what I always like to do as we um, want to give those that are joining us enough time to um, dial in, to, let's talk about who's joining us today. And so if you could type in the chat box, all panelists and attendees, and just a little greeting and tell me where you're dialing in from. So Shelly and I will be engaged with you throughout the entire hour. Um, we will uh, ask you to put questions in the Q&A segment. Um, let me just tell you, all right, jo is that Joey from Atlanta? Michelle, um, hi there. H hello from, um, where is that, from Toronto, Washington, D.C. So, Shelly, you can see all those that are joining us. I see us. them coming. This is exciting. Dallas, Illinois. <laughs> Bye. Oh, my God. <laughs> all right. So, Lana, hello. We're going to have to do a special screening. I think you've made them all. I know <laughs> Tiffany from Atlanta has been on all. We have San Jose, Kansas City, you, Arkansas. We are just so delighted that you all have joined us today. We have quite a treat for you. I'll tell you. Um, we have a legendary leader on the line with us today, uh, on camera with us today, and we're going to have lots of fun. So we, we don't even have half of those that have registered dialed in yet. So what I'm going to ask you uh, to continue to say hello and let us know where you're from. I see Christy from um, Fayetteville. Rhea from New York. Hello, Rhea Stern. I have to say she used to be my boss when I worked at DuPont. So she's a global marketing executive. Uh, so exciting to see you. Um, Atlanta again. And, and keep in mind, get ready for your questions, um, the Q&A. Have access to someone who has lived in the CEO, who has ran a corporate tech, uh, tech, technology company, who, has, who sits on the board of Verizon and Nordstrom. So get your questions ready. San Jose, California. Maryland, hello, Yolanda from Maryland. Yes, 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 yes. Hello from San, um, San Ramon, California. Thank yeah, you, see, thank you. I see names I recognize, so welcome. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so that we... And what you are in in for for a treat. Her topic re, uh, revolves around her book, Unapologetically Ambitious. She is going some of the takeaways that you will have on this: how to take charge of your career, how to create allies, and build a network of supporters. So she has named her book unapologetically ambitious, but I have had the honor of personally getting to know her, and I call her a legendary leader that is unapologetically unstoppable. So <laughs> let me give her a fitting introduction, and we will get right into the program. It is my pleasure to introduce Shelly Archambault, the former CEO of Metric Screen who Reed Hoffman, the co-founder and former executive chairman of LinkedIn, describes as the woman who pulled off the most incredible Silicon Valley turnaround you never heard of. Archambault currently sits on the boards of Nordstrom, Verizon, Roper Technology, and I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, Octa, yeah, thank you. Okay. She advises the Royal Bank of Canada, capital markets, as well as growing startups. 
She is regularly named on Who's Who's List in Technology. She is the author of Unapologetically Ambitious, Take Risks, Break Barriers, and Create Success on Your Own Term, a book that will inspire you and provide the tools to enable you to fight the battles, make the trade-offs, and create the life of your life you want. And we will have information on a slide at the end of this session. In her spare time, she warns, runs a gourmet dinner club. Oh my God, like I said, unstoppable. And writes a blog that provides career advice, insight, and other musings for her career at uh, Shelly, S-H-E-L-L-Y-E dot -E com. That's her blog. And so without further ado, please help me introduce with our virtual applause, uh, Shelly Archambault. And Shelly, if you could just start out with your greeting and hello, and just any way that you choose to open up our webinar. Well, thank you very much for that very generous and kind introduction, Sheila. I've been looking forward to today. Uh, to me, spending time talking with women about how to achieve what you want in life. So having a chance to interact with you all, answer your questions, I'm here for you. So please ask the questions that are on your mind. Not that I have all the answers, but I usually have some type of perspective to be able to share that might be helpful. I believe that all of you out there have more capability, more talent, are willing to work hard, but it's not always getting you where you want to be. So it's all about how do you take that ambition, that hard work, the talent capability, and use it strategically to be able to ultimately achieve your aspirations. So that's what my book's about, and hopefully those are things we'll talk about today. So Sheila, I'll pass it back to you. That's awesome. So, <laughs> You very clearly it might be a little internet problem so the screen is going in and out so I just want if you know you're a technology girl so I don't know if there's anything that you can look at um, can, you hear my, can you hear my voice okay is it just the visible or this visual or voice it's visual only. And we're gonna go with something very plain Okay. So that could be it. So while you're working on that, I think that, you know, a, a question. All right. There we go. All right. Yes. Okay. I think that a question that um, all of us have in mind, and, and, and what are you sharing now with, you know, some of the leaders that you're talking with on the boards? You know, what do we as leaders or anyone in our career? doing uh i know that we're going to eventually get on the other side of COVID, but i know it's going to look very different what are some things that we can do to be unapologetically um you know ambitious and driven during this era and uh, position ourselves for when we get on the other side of it now is a great time to actually self-reflect one of the things that i believe is that we all have superpowers but many of us actually have not spent the time to figure out what our superpower is. My superpowers, for instance, because you understand what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the ability to lead a team. I'm not talking about the ability to code you know, great things. I'm actually talking about intrinsic capabilities that you have and that you have developed, cultivated, right, and grown. So my superpowers, for instance, is my courage. I am willing to say what needs to be said. I am willing to step forward. I am willing to put myself at risk, in essence, right, to make points, et cetera. So courage is one of mine. And the other one is discipline. I, I set a target or a goal or objective or I say I'm gonna do something and I do it. Those are superpowers because I can leverage those skills Mm -hmm. to make me a better leader, a better employee, right? A better teammate. So now's mm -hmm. the time to look at yourself and say, what are my superpowers? And then how do I continue to strengthen them? Because a superpower, just like anything else, it's muscle. And if you don't use it, 
it dims and it gets weak and it's no longer a power for you. So you need to understand what they are and then continue to strengthen and build and grow so that you can really leverage them in life. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> would you share an example of how you would use your um, superpower courage, let's say that you are a leader in an organization that is not impacted by um, uh, layoffs or furloughs because of COVID and a leader that is impacted um, by COVID. So, uh, you know, two examples on either side. How would you use the superpower of courage in, in if you're in a leadership role? Absolutely. So when you're, if you're in a leadership role and let's say your company not affected by COVID, we'll, we'll take that one, right? Then using your courage is making sure that things that need to be done, things that need to be said, are actually used up and either being said because you're saying them and or doing them. For, for instance, you know, a lot of companies give lip service to different initiatives. They'll say we're doing all these things and they show 12 initiatives. But we all know that maybe four of them have truly the weight behind them. Well, if one of those six or eight or whatever is one of your areas that you think is really important, not just to you personally, but to the company and the company's success, then you need to actually speak up and make sure that the right focus and power gets put behind that particular initiative. If you are someone who has been, let's say, impacted by COVID, maybe your particular role has either been di diminished or eliminated as a result of COVID. Well, now's the time to use your courage to reach out to people that you know to ask for their help. And it takes courage to do that because you show yourself as being vulnerable. So there are multiple ways of using courage. Courage is when you force yourself to do something that you don't really want to do because you're afraid. And that afraid can be afraid or afraid that you'll be seen in the wrong way or that you'll get embarrassed or you won't get the response you want. You know, all those things create these little fears that prevent us from stepping forward. Thank Does that you help so you? For that. that is wonderful. And I'm certain it, it, it has, uh, I have the privilege and honor of knowing Shelly's background and, um, to you, those of you have have not, I'm sure you will when you read her book. But I, we were, we honored her with a Mosaic Award this year and had the opportunity to hear her voice. So I would like for you to share a little bit about how you took charge from day one. Your story is fascinating. When you knew that you wanted to be a CEO of a company, how did you take charge? You took charge of your career long before you got into your career. What can uh, share how you went about that and what others have learned from your journey that it, it will definitely fall right in line with how we can take charge of our career? Absolutely. It was very clear to me early in life, Sheila, that I wasn't going to get what I wanted. The odds were just not, not in my favor. And it, all I had to do was to look around. I mean, there was no internet. So if you were looking for leaders in business, it was the magazines or TV, et cetera. And frankly, I just didn't see men. I mean, I saw men, but I didn't see many women. And I definitely didn't see a woman of color running companies. So therefore, odds aren't in my favor. So I sat there and said, now what can I do about it? And what I can do about it is put a plan in place to improve my odds. And that's what I've done my entire career. So literally in high school, I decided I wanted to run a company. So I said, all right, I've got to get credentials because nobody's going to believe this, you know, little black girl, if you will, that's coming out here is capable of much. So let me go get the best credential I can. So I went to Wharton and then it was, let me go find a company that is a leader in their space and in an industry that's growing because that's when there are most opportunities is when companies are growing. So I picked IBM because back then IBM was the Google or the Apple of its day and they were growing. When companies are growing, they tend to give you opportunities earlier because they're always short on resource. So that's why it's important to be with companies that are actually growing. And I got that opportunity and I mm -hmm. scaled my way, if you will, all the way through. But every step, it was setting a goal, figuring out a strategy. How do I make it happen? How do I improve my odds? 
and then being disciplined about doing what I said I was going to do. You know, Sheila, many people set goals. Some people mm -hmm. try to put a plan in place to achieve their goal, but very few people make decisions every day consistent with their plans. And that's where discipline comes in. And that's where the power is. That is awesome. Okay, so just from that, any of us on this call today, put a plan in place to improve your arts, odds, you know, get the credentials, the certification, read books. I mean, we have a dynamic book that we can read um, while we're waiting to get on the other side of COVID and while we're navigating working to the best of our ability during COVID. And I love how you talked about your superpower discipline and how a goal is just a goal and you, when are you going to achieve it? I know for a fact, many people that are on this call that have put some goals in place. Can you talk a little bit about your superpower discipline and how it helps you become consistent? And to those of us that may say, what do I need to do? I know we can go read a book to figure out how we can really apply discipline to our life, but we want to hear from you. Talk. Certainly. So uh, first of all, I'll tell you, discipline is a muscle like anything else. It's not that I was born out of the crib with this discipline. It's just that I learned that if I actually did what I said I was gonna do, I had much better outcomes. So I started, man, when I, I not only set goals and I not only put plans in place, but I always made them time defined so that I had a goal post and knew whether I was on track or not on track. And then the other thing I did is I used other people and my own sense of pride to actually help me stay on track. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'd set a goal and then I'd tell people. Now, talk about taking a risk, right? Because if you actually tell people what you wanna do and then you don't do it, right? What does that do to your overall brand, your perception, et cetera? So it actually gives you extra impetus. I'll, I'll give you a really simple example. For a long time there, really up until about two, two or three years ago, I used to set a physical goal for myself. It was my way of keeping my workouts you know, interesting and what have you. So I'd pick something that I couldn't do at the beginning of the year and say, all right, by the end of the year, I'll be able to do it. So for instance, they were crazy goals like a one arm push up, right? Like 10 pull ups, you know, things that I couldn't do. I didn't have that muscle mass in those areas. And then I tell everybody, that's my goal for this year. And you know what that meant? That meant when I woke up at quarter to six in the morning, instead of rolling back over, I got my ass up and got out of bed and went to the gym because I knew that I needed to be able, at the end of the year, people were gonna say, so Shelly, were you able to do it? And I didn't wanna say, no, I slacked. I wanna say, yeah, I did it. So telling, you know, putting those goals, those timed defined goals out there helps you stay accountable to everybody else who's gonna ask you for it. So I've done that throughout my career as well. I tell people what I want to do. And then, you know, I have to make sure I do it so that I can keep my, my pride <laughs> and keep my brand. I told you she's <laughs> unstoppable. So, you know, just, you could tell that you, your um, achievements, you know, that you put things in place so that you can um, make the achievements that you set out to. I like that you started pulling in you would get other people to, to support you. That's a good segue into the second bullet on the takeaways from this call. I am gonna keep us um, on time because I wanna get to some of the questions that were sent in. So how do we create allies and build a network of supporters? Uh, you know, the best way to do it is by giving. Uh, and you know, it's such a simple concept. But what I found, and you know, it's funny, we all learn this in Sunday school, but what I found is that if you give to others, help others, share with others, be there for others, that many of them will actually be there for you. Wow. So, you know, I, I, I don't believe that, you know, building a, I call it a village, by the way, you know, and people talk about their networks, whole, but I call mine my village because it takes a village to raise a child. And honestly, I'm still, as long as I'm still growing and learning, I've still got the child in me and I need a village. So I've created my village by trying to be there for 
my friends, colleagues, professionals, frankly, even people that I haven't yet met. But if I can do and I can share and I can give, I try to do that. And I've just found over time that people will tend to give it right back. So relationships, when you're trying to build those supporters, it's not how many business cards you have or you know, how many names you've got in your email distribution list or whatever. It's really how many relationships you have. How many, how many people do you have that literally, if you picked up the phone and said, oh my God, Andrea, I need you. Or Cheryl, can you please help me. Or, you know, name it. How many people do you have that then will actually show up and will literally be there for you? That's how you determine the strength of your village. And if your village isn't strong, then I would tell you to start giving to others and it'll come. I like how you have there are some relationships that you have not even started to build uh, or, or develop. And, you know, so that reminds me of many of us that may be on this phone, that we know that we have some visions, some goals, and, and some dreams that's aligned with our, our, our goals and ambition. You know, what are some examples and ways that we can start b getting our foot into doors that um, we're not in now and that are crucial network, you know, uh, developing relationships with people that is crucial for us to get to that next level. You know, it's interesting because it, it, it all starts with trying to be accessible yourself, right? Making yourself accessible. So, you know, what I've found is let's say in a, in a business setting, corporate environment, for instance, you know, you can always see the, you know, the executives, the top tier, and they're kind of out there and they're a bit untouchable. So you feel uncomfortable reaching out. But a lot of times you'll pass by them. You might pass by them in an elevator, in a hallway, heck, you know, leaving the building at night, who knows, but you may have passed by them. And when you pass by them, you have the opportunity of just saying, good night, hello, good morning, you know, how are you, right? Just a real quick thing. Well, obviously that doesn't create a relationship. But what you can do instead is actually when you pass by someone, you know, you say, hello, John, how are you? I was just thinking about you the other day. And they'll be like, what? Who are you? Right? That'll be the sauce. Be like, what? Who are you? So you have to have these ready, by the way. And you can say, yes, I actually had to make a presentation to blah, 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 blah. And I was channeling how I've seen you present in front of the company and trying hard to live up to your capability, right? I mean, just something. I'm just giving you right off the cuff, but you come up with something. Two things will happen. Now, that took that long, so you could do that as you're walking, as you're passing, right? It was that fast. But now, you've made an impression because that's probably not something that person hears very much, and certainly not from someone they know. So that's probably like lodged right in there. So now the next time you see them, odds are, they're actually going to remember you. So it won't be a high nod. It'll be a, oh, you know what I mean? Because you complimented them. People love to be complimented. They love to be stroked. So use that. Um, but so there are ways, even when you don't have set times to be able to spend a ton of time and share everything you're going on to actually start building that. And if you don't do a compliment, ask a quick question, right? Susan, right? As you see them say, Susan, I'm glad I ran into you just real quick. And then these you need just to have ready where I've, whatever, I'm trying to reach a key customer at such and such, right? Ask them a question that they can answer quickly where they don't even have to break stride, right? They don't have to stop. You don't have to schedule an appointment, but it's easy for them to answer or respond because now they give you the answer. You say, great, you go off, but then you get a chance to drop them a note to say, thank you. I took your advice. It was so helpful. What am I doing? I'm stroking. I'm complimenting, I'm right, all of that, so that you become memorable. So there's ways to do this. You know, go to events, go to things, people always go, but then they don't know how to talk to people. Just start talking. Walk up to someone and say, you know, it's my first time at this event, and I don't know anybody. I mean, literally, you start a conversation that way. So just start, start a conversation, and then follow up with people. So many people never follow up, so they have a bunch of names, but nobody they can call. These are great nuggets, 
And I can't imagine that they're not in the book, but while I shift to some of the questions and I'm going to ask those that are on the call, please put any questions you have in the Q and A box. What made you want to write the book? Um, unapologetically ambitious because you help so many people, um, you know, and, and I can only imagine that that has something to do with it. So what about this book and this title that you thought uh, readers would really, really benefit from? Thank you. Well, first, you know, why the book? I have tried, honestly, throughout my career to be very accessible. Believe it or not, I actually respond. I answered all emails, LinkedIn's, you know, Instagram's, whatever. I actually respond. But I can't actually sit down and meet with everybody. And while, yes, I absolutely try to share, you know, this event, other things like it, but I was trying to find a way to actually share the things that I've learned, strategies, approaches, techniques, frankly, at scale and with a broader set of people. And that's why I wrote the book, because this period of my career is all about impact and inspiration. So I'll go back to what I said in the beginning. There is so much talent out there. So many of us, especially women and people of color, who have more capabilities than we ever have the opportunity to show and demonstrate. And that's a shame. Mm. So I want to give people tools. I want to give people approaches. I want to give people inspiration on how to actually better leverage those, use those to get more out of life, get more of what they want out of life. So that's why I wrote the book, to try to just communicate more at scale. And the title, I have to tell you, it took me forever to come up with the title, but here's why the title is so important to me. One, as women, we are from the crib, we are born to apologize. We apologize for everything. Whether I did it, I didn't do it. Whether somebody else did it, I still apologize. And it's held against us. It's held against us because men don't see apologizing the same way we see it. So I wanted to say unapologetically, right? We are not apologizing and we are ambitious. And so many times ambitious is actually used as a bad thing. In business, we might be told we're too ambitious or we're too aggressive or we're too, et cetera, right? And I'm like, baloney. We deserve to be just as ambitious as anybody else. And therefore the title is unapologetically ambitious. That is spot on. I know I personally have had a problem with, I always say, I'm sorry. So, you know, what keeps you inspired? That's one of the things. What keeps you inspired and, and full of all that you do? Honestly, I love it when people I have touched in some way get benefit are able to achieve more than they thought they could achieve, able to actually hit their aspirations, are able to grow, just even just have a better experience in life, whatever it is. But honestly, I just want to impact and inspire people so that they get a little bit more joy in life and hopefully get more of what they want out of life, professionally and personally. That's what brings me joy. Okay. All right. Here's a great question online. Um, Marquita wants to know, as an African-American woman, how do you speak up when your view is not in line with groupthink? Ah, this is where courage comes in. So a uh, couple ways to do it, and it all depends upon the dynamics. So number one, let's say you're in a, a group setting, everybody seems to have a different opinion than you do, and you're sitting there just like, why doesn't anybody see this? So first thing, take a deep breath, get your courage and interject. Say, you know, I think those are all good ideas and good concepts, but one, whatever, approach, perspective, idea, whatever it happens to be, right, that I have that I think it's worth considering is X. And then just say it. Now, how do you do that? People are like, oh my God. The way you do that is you think about what is the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is people will say, that's a dumb idea, right? That's the worst that can happen. Mm -hmm. And what did that actually do to you? All right, so if you're sensitive, it may have hurt your feelings a little bit, right? It might have hurt your pride, but did it change who you are? Did it impact your family? Did it stop you from paying your bills? Did it, right? When all the important things, 
are not impacted by that. So what's the real risk? They might think about you differently for one comment? No. Now, if you made 100 comments that everybody thought was dumb, that's different, right? But no, it's okay. So put it out there. The other thing you can do is if you're not comfortable by yourself, that's when you do sidebars. You know a discussion's coming because it's been happening multiple times, you have a different view. Try to find an ally. Chat with someone else about your idea who has a seat at the table. And then when you raise it, ask them if they believe in it to actually reinforce your point in the meeting. So you can do that too. The bottom line is have courage. Otherwise what happens is somebody says something, you're like, man, I was thinking that. And you don't get credit for it. Yeah, and I want to side to that too, I believe. Um, I think that's my speaker that's kind of off. I'm sorry. Is my sound okay? Can you hear me? It is now. now. It is now. Okay. Um, the other side of that is suppose that you are right. You know that you had the courage. You spoke up to something that is the best, but it was not necessarily ignored but the majority decided not to do it. So I think that we as women, sometimes when things like that happen and we know we're right, we can, it causes us to lose confidence. What can we do to not lose confidence, to continue to be unapologetically ambitious and to know that it's their loss, it's gonna affect in the long run, it's gonna come back up. So what can we do as, as a woman leader uh, when, our contribution is not value. Well, so here's, here's what you do. Let's say you put up the idea. Ah, it was thrown around, but it was basically dismissed and they went with something else. So then you go to, and I don't know the dynamic, let's say your boss is in the room, right? It's a team meeting, your boss is in the room, he makes the call. After the meeting's over, you basically grab your boss to say, I have a question for you, just so that I can learn and make sure that I am continuing to evolve. I suggested X, but we decided not to do it. In your opinion, what would have made my idea stronger, right? What would have made it work, whereas it doesn't appear it's working now? So what you're doing is you're asking feedback of how could you have created maybe a stronger, right, proposal or suggestion or whatever it is. So do that. Don't just go off and hide and lick your wounds because then you don't learn anything from it. The key, the key to all of this is constant learning. And by the way, leaders want to see people who are intellectually curious, who are actually trying to constantly learn. So when you go up to your boss and say, hey, what could I have done differently so that next time I can make a stronger contribution? The boss gets two points. One, he gets the point that you are actually going to speak up for yourself, that you actually are ambitious, and that you actually are willing to invest in yourself because you took the time to do that. And number two, in the future, Hmm. He might listen a little closer because he knows that you're actually putting thought behind what it is that you're doing. Yeah. So, that yep. That's a great point. So before we go to the next question, um, I know that you uh, received a degree in business, the top business school in the world, probably at that time. And, um, but you ended up in technology. Can you speak a little bit about, that transition and what uh, women in tech may have to deal with. I mean, there's a huge leadership gap for women across the board, especially for women of color. And then you add tech on top of that. So can you speak to some of those differences and would you recommend anything different? Cause I've always heard that working in, a woman working in tech, a woman of color working in tech that has special needs. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So, I believe that risk and reward are two sides of the same coin. So mm -hmm. is tech higher risk? The answer is, yeah, it is. But at the same time, there's, I think, bigger opportunities as a result of that risk. So mm -hmm. are there special needs? The answer is, yeah. You need to make sure, remember that village I talked about? You need to make sure you've actually got a village. You need to make sure you have a cheerleader. And for those of you that have not heard me talk about cheerleaders, a cheerleader is someone that is in your court, is someone that is reminding you no matter what happens, no matter what anybody says to you, they remind you how good you are, how capable you are, how awesome you are. They remind you the person that you are so that you don't get beaten down, so that you don't get your confidence 
totally eroded. My husband was my biggest cheerleader, but I had others. And I'll tell you, it matters because there are times when the world is telling you that you just aren't anything. And you need somebody, some people reminding you, oh, yes, you are. Get back up and get back in there. Is it hard? Yeah, it's hard. But you can do it. If we don't do it and we don't push forward, then we won't get our fair share of the opportunity. And it's like anything else. All of us have opportunities today because of the hard work and the risks that people took generations before us. So we have to keep doing the same thing. Absolutely. Great response. Okay, there is a question. Um, Ayari, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Any advice for overcoming the frustration of the constant leadership change in growth companies? It feel like, feels like I'm constantly having to position myself with new leaders and they're gone before I get to pay those relationships off in my career. <laughs> yeah, that's, that is the downside of a high growth company. You're absolutely right. Uh, the key is, remember, it's more than just your boss that influences what happens with your career. So you need to be building relationships kind of across the management team, not just with your boss, but it is just something that happens. So the key is you need to make sure you're making impacts quickly and fast because you know, the good news is you know it now. So it's no surprise when they change because you know it's going to happen. So you should figure anytime anybody gets in a role, all right, I got 12 months. I got 12 months to make an impact. I got 12 months to make a difference. And I'm going to go do that. So set yourself goals and timelines. You can't do it on a slow, methodical pace because you're going to miss out. And then make relationships beyond just your existing manager so that you have other people who become your supporters and become the ones that are, you know, um, vouching for you and supporting you, right, going, going forward. And so, you know, when you start talking about fast pace, it reminds me of digital transformation, what's happening and, and you know, research and editorially, um, I've read that it's at the top of every CEO's mind. So digital transformation is gonna change the landscape of the world. How would you say that we should like jump on this, get ready for it? You know, just anything that you would like to say about where we are vibing from this um, big, huge digital transformation revolution. Yeah, let, let me just give you my very simple definition of this digital transformation. Every company is becoming a tech company. That's basically what it means. Every company has to figure out how they leverage technology to bring additional value to their customers, to their shareholders, and to their employees. Wow. That's what digital transformation is. So when you say, how do you get on board? You're already in it. This isn't a matter of getting on board. You are in it. And what it really means is you have to be adaptable. You have to be agile and you have to be willing to not only accept change, but embrace change. So the way you lean in on all this is by actually being the one that is driving the change. Every company out there needs more leaders that are actually helping to push change, to push change management, to bring others along, et cetera. And that's a capability that you can do in any role. So Shelly, my next question, you sit on boards. You've been the CEO of a company. You currently have networks with probably as many of Fortune 500 CEOs as you can. So I know that you have, um, you, you're, in, you're in places that many of us have never been. This digital transformation in COVID-19, how do you think it is going to impact women and people of color? And is there any advice you would give to women on this call and people of color where it uh, relates to how diversity inclusion and gender diversity is going to be first and foremost when companies are worrying about how to digitize, how to, you know, uh, like you said, become a tech company. Every company is becoming a tech company and how to save their company because of what has happened with COVID. Yeah. 
this, this is a time when you can't sit back and watch and wait and worry about what might happen to you. You cannot play the victim because if you play the victim, you will become the victim. You actually have to figure out how you get engaged and how you help bring forward ideas and change. So what's going on with companies? So first, you know, the first stage of COVID was every company had to just say, oh my God, are we gonna survive? And it was all hands on deck just to get, make sure that the franchise was gonna survive and continue. Now, most of the energy is being spent not on that, but on what do we as a company look like and what is our strategy and our vision given that COVID is gonna change the world. We are never going back to the world we had in January. We aren't. The world is gonna be impacted permanently by COVID in some ways, just like we were by 9-11. I mean, it just happens. So how does that change the strategy? How does it change our focus and our priorities? And where do we need to go? So that's what companies are thinking about now. So if you're not engaged in that conversation anyway with companies or organizations or even your own company, then you're missing out. So figure out how you actually get engaged, bring ideas forward, talk in those terms. All of that shows that you are being agile, that you are being flexible, right? That you want to be part of the solution going forward. And it's always best. I love to no, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sheila. No, 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 go ahead. Uh, the only thing I was gonna say, it's always best during times like these to try to work your way into roles that are customer facing or affect the bottom line. Those are the jobs that tend to be most important and most valued when times get challenged. So if you're not in those two directly, then try to get into them indirectly so that you're supporting the person that's supporting the customer, right? But those are the other things I would suggest. So go ahead, Sheila. I love how, I'm sorry, my speaker is off. I don't know. I don't know if it got wet or what. But I love how you said now is not the time to play the victim. So instead of us focusing our energies and times on, um, you know, what's going to happen with diversity and inclusion, my ERG is going to go away. I, I used to say when I was, you know, ambitiously developing myself for my next role that the only color that matters is green. And so what you're saying is to get involved, be a part of the solution present yourself when you walk in somewhere, only be concerned about how you're gonna help your organization make money instead of them giving you a job because of your gender or your race and background. Mm -hmm. Love that. Okay, I'm gonna to get to a couple of questions and um, I see uh, someone is asking, what do you do when others consist consistently take credit for your work? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it all depends upon where they do that and how they do that. So, you know, for instance, let's say you're in a meeting and you worked on a project with somebody and that person is the one that's actually presenting the results of the project, right? Acting like they did it all by themselves. Uh, so at one point during, either during or when it finishes and people are saying, hey, thank you very much. That was great, et cetera. You should also do the same thing. Thank the person's taking credit. So, you know, John, Thank you. Thank you very much for that, that presentation. You did such a good job of outlining the work that we did to create blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Now what you've done is you've complimented and inserted yourself. Right? What you don't do is say, uh, yo, that was me. All right? Because that doesn't work. You don't get support for that. You don't get help for that. So instead, you basically shame them through love. Um, and when you, you know, if it's not in a meeting when you're there, but it's something that you heard about, oh, so-and-so presented such and such and, and you weren't there and took all the credit, ah, well then what you do is you make sure you go to, let's say your joint boss or the, someone that's in leadership that around it at some point and say, listen, I heard that John got great feedback for the work on XYZ project. And they'll say, yes, really did a good job. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that because I worked so hard with him and I just wanted to make sure that it was all worth it in the end. Right? I love that. You see what I'm saying? So that's how to do it. Okay. Questions, and we are 15 minutes before the top of the hour. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. But questions that were sent in in advance, and I like these because 
I do, I feel that um, we're labeled, sometimes labeled differently for being driven. Uh, this question is how do you recover from being labeled aggressive? And I'm gonna add the one under it that asks, how can I be more assertive and have set boundaries in the workplace while I'm trying to climb the corporate ladder. And I put those two together because what that means to me, you know, everything is moving fast and quick. I mean, we don't have time. We got to hit the ground running. So I need to be assertive. I need to set some boundaries. I need to make some things happen, but I don't want to be labeled aggressive or something else. Yeah. So the first thing that I find is if somebody, if somebody's called you aggressive and they don't mean it in a positive way, which they never do when it comes to women, aggressive is actually a positive um, adjective when used with men. But when it's used with you, don't, don't take it at face value. If somebody says you're just too aggressive, don't get upset. What you say instead is, really? What do you mean by that? And let them actually break it down for you. Because what you may find is some people actually don't know how to communicate. Most people don't know how to communicate. So if you actually force them to break it down, again, in a nice way, because you're trying to learn. So help me, under, you know, help me understand. All this is not aggressive at all, right? Help me understand. And they say, well, you, know, you, just, um, you just put your ideas forward too forcefully. Okay. Um, what do you think is the best way to actually put forward ideas? So what, what you want to do is you want to now turn this person who has said that you are too aggressive into ultimately a supporter because you start treating him like, you know, I'd really like to learn from you. Because obviously, since you've, you've, you're trying to help me by giving me feedback, they weren't trying to help you, but that doesn't matter because you're trying to help me for giving me feedback, right? I really love to know, how do you think I should have done it? And by the way, when you see me next time, I'd love you to tell me whether you thought that was effective or not effective. And so what you're doing is you're basically turning them into someone who is, you're just too ambitious, you're just too aggressive, into a mentor who is now going to help you, right, be more effective. And guess what? When that happens, they're going to be like, oh, yes, when you do well, they're going to start taking credit for you. But you know what? It's okay. My goal in my entire career was to have as many people take credit for my success as possible. Because when they take credit for you, they're talking about you. And if they're talking about you, your name, your brand, everything is getting out there. So turn all those people into mentors before they even know it. That is so, you know, you talked about, we started at the top of the hour talking about the goals you set and how you knew early on that you wanted to be CEO of our company and you have your journey has been amazing um, with the boards you sit on and being the CEO of a technical company still when you look back at they say the younger you know you coming right going maybe your first job into corporate America what is something that you witnessed being a woman number one period and then on top of that being a one of, woman of color that had you known that you could share with some, some of us a secret sauce that had you applied, maybe you would have moved faster. I'm not saying you would accomplish greater goals, so I don't know what else greater you could have done, but maybe you would have lose, you, uh, you, uh, moved a little faster and maybe you could help us uh, accomplish our goals. Sure, so you know, one thing that I actually learned later in my career that I wish I had understood earlier, when I say late, I mean, heck, now 15 years into my career, uh, was the value of actually having external advisors. So I spent the first 15 years of my career in IBM. And all of the people that I um, built relationships with and that I would go to for you know, advice, help, whatever it was, all tended to be IBMers because I also moved around a ton. So therefore, that's where I had my relationships were all IBMers. And I didn't realize the value of actually getting perspectives from outside the company until I left IBM. And I wish I'd actually done it sooner because I think it would have helped me make even better decisions, have even better perspectives, you know, the whole bit. So build a set of advisors outside. And oh, by the way, it's not advisors. I'm not talking about mentors and people to help you get the next job. It's people to help you kill the job you currently have because you're not going anywhere mm -hmm. until you kill the job you've got. 
So get help doing that. So um, all cancer activists in the chat, uh, they're so grateful um, for these nuggets you are leaving. They, uh, they love it. And, you know, we are just so grateful for you. We are going to put up a slide at the end with information on how to get Shelly's book because I just can't imagine. Is it on Audible? Because I will download it and walk on my <laughs> It will be. It's not, it's not yet. And actually, the, yeah, the book is currently on pre-order. Um, and let me just share. Can I just share a couple things on that? Sheila, thank you. So the book is on pre-order and it's basically a book about how, how to get what you want out of life professionally and personally. And I talk about being intentional and the strategies, approaches, tactics, techniques, tricks, whatever you want to call them, what worked and frankly what didn't. And by the way, when I say get what you want out of life, I mean personally and professionally because they go together. You only have one life. Now, what I wanted to say real quick to Sheila is one of the things that I'm, I'm offering here and I'm offering for this month is if you pre-order the book uh, mm -hmm. and you actually take a picture of your confirmation and either tweet it or put it on Instagram or LinkedIn, whatever, and just say, hey, I bought it and tagged me along with unapologetically ambitious, I'm going to pick one person this month to actually spend 45 minutes in a one-on-one -on -one mentoring session. Um, so it's a way to, to win if you'd like to do that, but then support me in general. And the people that pre-order are the first ones to get the book when it ships. Uh, so I would say do that. The other is, if you've gotten some nuggets from this session, do me a favor, just tweet them out, you know, put them on Instagram, whatever, and just tag me. Let me know that you got value, which ones were of value. Because I'm also trying to figure out what are the things that people want to hear and what do they need. So that would help me too. And follow me on LinkedIn. I put out, I try to post and put out inspiration and thoughts as, you know, pretty often. So those, that would be my commercial, Sheila, if that's okay. Oh, it's mutually beneficial. I mean, it's a win-win, you know, it's like we are following someone that is sitting in rooms that we are either trying to get in or help others get in. And that's the beauty of this, because anyone that's on this call I mean, that's what we should be doing. We should be trying to help ourselves get into uh, to rooms to accomplish our, our career goals or helping others do it. And for that reason, you can count me in. Um, I'm gonna see how much time we have. Uh, we have seven minutes, so I'm going to find another question, but share anything that you wanted to share before we have to log off, we keep it to time, and I'll be checking to see if there are any other questions in our Q&A and chat. Oh yeah, we do. We have questions here. My apology, I did not scroll down. Um, Post-COVID world, we have a lot of opportunities in which industries and in which roles do you see the most opportunities for women? I think that's a great question because when we talk about how the world is going to be so different, just like things change for 9-11, it's so easy for some of us, me personally, to immediately go to the, the things that are not going to be good. What are some good things that are going to be on the uh, other side and possible opportunities that we should, as women should be preparing for? So I'll tell you, at times of disruption, which is what we're in, disruption always breeds more opportunity. So if you think about it, I made the point earlier about every company is becoming a technology company. The other thing that happens during crises is any trends that were currently underway get accelerated and that's happening. So for instance, the Zoom calls we're on today, I mean, yes, people were doing video calls and yes, we were doing it. It's now 1000 fold. And by the way, just when we get finished with COVID, it's not gonna go back to where it was. It may not stay quite as high as it is now, but it's gonna stay pretty high. Um, people are gonna travel less. People are going to want to be able to work from wherever they want to work. So anything that's involving how people collaborate, um, software or technology to make that happen, et cetera, will be important. But the other thing I think will also be important is frankly strong management. When you have to manage people that are far flung, it's a harder job. And oh, by the way, it's more important that the people that do that are actually strong managers. Otherwise, people will actually leave. So I think you're going to see more companies actually spend more dollars in development. 
because they're going to realize that if they don't have strong managers on the front line, they're not going to be able to retain the top skill that they want to retain going forward. I also think in certain industries, whether it is healthcare, um, I think those will continue to grow and to, and to shine, tech for sure. Um, anything that deals with, um, anything that deals with um, services that help people get value that they want without physically going different places. And so I'm making that a very general statement, but all of that is gonna happen as well. You know, the key during these times, if you're looking for where to go, is listen. You know, listen to what people are saying. Look at what books they're actually reading, especially nonfiction. It tends to help you figure out what trends, you know, are coming and, and where they are. But bottom line is, I think now is the time for the woman leader. Because being a good manager and being a good communicator, we tend to over-index on that because we bring more empathy in general in terms of to the job. And we're also tend to be more collaborative. So I think now, frankly, is the time for women, especially in terms of to shine. So let's, you know, let's go after it. Let's be ambitious. Let's put our plans in place and let's let people know what we want and go get it. Yeah. Let's, let's end on um, self-care because you, you've talked about how Zoom, you know, I've heard others say, and I'm experiencing it myself, we had to deal with transitioning to things we did physically to virtually, and we were like, okay, we can do it. And then once we transition, we realized, wait a minute, I've been working from seven this morning to seven at night, nonstop. Okay, I got to be here for my West Coast team. I got to be here for my East Coast team. And people know, they know I'm at home, so I can't say I can't be on the call or I'm traveling. So, I mean, we're working harder. So can you speak a little bit about the importance of us um, focusing on our self-care as well? Oh, absolutely. It's a slippery slope because suddenly we're always, always available, right? And that doesn't work because at the end of the day, you're actually not. Yes, you're at home, but you are not always available. So, you know, if you need to, you block your time and you communicate it. And East Coast team, West Coast team, whatever, from 1 to 2 p.m., I'm not available. All right? You just declare it. And you tell people when you're going to start and, you know, if you need to, when you're going to end. And you can't do calls and things in terms of before or after on a regular basis. Exceptions, sure. Those things happen. But you have to actually define and create, if you will, your own boundaries, because people all work different. And oh, by the way, with so many of us that have kids and stuff at home, it's actually easier sometimes to work from 6 a.m. until about 9, then take your break, and then work for And that's okay, too, as long as you get it all in. The key is just get your work done. Now, what I would tell you is, at times like these, especially bad managers, and by the way, there are more bad managers than there are good managers, in my opinion. Um, but because that's the case, we have to learn how to work for bad managers too. So over-communicate. Make sure you are telling your boss, not what you're doing every day, that's not what I mean, but status on your activity. So depending what your role is, you know, you might have three main projects, two different things, whatever. Just make sure you're periodically, you know, dropping notes about either progress that you've made, maybe a stumbling block that you're working through, whatever it is, because people unfortunately for some people if you're out of sight you're out of mind and therefore they think you're not working and by the way we all do this we all look around our teams our co-workers people on our you know workforce whatever and like man i'm working so hard so obviously others must not be and the key is you just don't see what everybody's doing so you just make the assumption so in order to make sure that you are overcoming that assumption about yourself you just have to communicate well, thank you so much. I'm going to recap this wonderful. So will you choose one person a month or just one person this month for a coaching session? Actually, I'm doing, um, doing it by month. So I'm going to do anyone who purchases in May and posts about it, they'll go into the drawing, which is why I said tag me and tag unapologetically ambitious because that's how we we'll track it. I'll pick one and I'll announce it. I did it for last month, actually, and I'm announcing the winner, I think, today or tomorrow. Um, on, uh, so yes, I will do it for May. Um, I will do it for June, but probably not after because what I'm trying to drive with it, frankly, is the pre-orders. And let me explain why. Pre-orders are critical for brand new authors. Pre-orders yes. tell the publishers tell them whether to carry your book or not carry your book. So I really need the pre-orders. So I'm just telling you, if you got any value out of what you heard today, please just pre-order the book and tell maybe half a dozen of your friends 
but I would so appreciate it. And I do believe you'll get value. And if not, you tell me and I'll give you your money back when it comes out. All right. Ellie, that is all for today. And don't forget to visit her blog, follow her on her social media outlets, pre-order her book. And we at Diversity Woman Media, moving forward, your leadership connection during these times. Look forward to seeing you during lunch on next Thursday. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.